We're in chapter 6 here in the book of Ecclesiastes. We'll begin by just reading verses 1 and 2, and then we'll go through our passage. This may be a, a shorter Bible study tonight because we only have 12 verses, and you know I can't go long. <laughs> but I think it'll be a shorter study tonight, so we'll find out. Verse 1, Ecclesiastes chapter 6, reading all the way to verse 2. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is common among men. A man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor, so that he lacks nothing for himself of all that he desires. Yet God does not give him power to eat of it, but a foreigner consumes it. This is vanity, and it is an evil affliction. Now, as we've been going through the book of Ecclesiastes, in chapter 5, Solomon had written that a person who rejoices daily in God's blessings has few regrets, and that's because God keeps him busy, he said, with the joy of his heart. He had said that in verse 20 of chapter 5, speaking of him, he said, he will not dwell unduly on, uh, on the days of his life, because God keeps him busy with the joy of his heart, and so uh, this understanding that, uh, that God will keep him busy with the joy of his heart should provoke him to uh, store up as many happy memories as are possible. And so he had closed with chapter 5 by saying that and now moves into chapter 6. And so as we move into chapter 6, Solomon at this point returns to his thoughts concerning the futility of wealth. Now he had just said that silver... And abundance is not completely satisfying. Uh, the thing that is satisfying is understanding that God is the giver of all good gifts. So with that in mind, he's saying, enjoy your relationship with God. Do not rely on wealth to give to you those things that can only come through the Lord. Again, we looked at that, but we do have a tendency, especially today, but I think this is something that is, is within the heart of all human beings from almost the beginning, and that we think that the more we have, the happier we'll be. And so we always have to take things in perspective. You know, if, if a, a person who has very little lectures you and says, oh, don't get caught up with wealth and this and that, you may have a tendency of thinking, well, the only reason you're saying that is because you don't have any. So you have no practical experience concerning wealth and, and the things that it can buy. And, and when you say that money can't make me happy, I'm happier now than if I were poor. So come on, give me a break. And you can think that way because this person who's lecturing you or whatever is a person that really doesn't know what it's like to have an abundance. And so you may not listen to that person very closely, though their wisdom is accurate. But when you hear somebody like Solomon speaking, a very extremely rich man, and he's saying, I'm telling you, I've had it all. I never withheld anything from my eyes. The things I desired, these are the things I had. And we've already gone through the list of the things that he's possessed, the things that he was able to buy. You know, in, in his kingdom, silver and gold were, were like sand. They were like dust. He had so much of it, it, it really wasn't something that tempted him. And that's the point he's making. He's saying, in, in, in all of your getting, there are things that matter more than the material and you have to be careful about that because material goods will never give you soul satisfaction. So the key to joy in life is pursuing the Lord. And, and it's learning to trust him daily for his provisions and his blessings. In Matthew 6, verse 33, Jesus said that. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And so when you pursue the Lord, you learn to be content in whatever estate you're in. When you pursue the Lord, you, learn the, you le learn the secret of contentment. So the key to contentment is to focus on the giver of gifts and not just the gifts. Because God is the one who gives all gifts. And God is the one who gives to us those things that are necessary for us. And Solomon is pointing that out. So when you receive something from the Lord, you receive his gifts with gratitude. And you bless others as you have been blessed. And when we yield to his will in our lives and we use what he gives us to his glory, then we learn the secret of enjoying life and we become satisfied. So with that said, Solomon is continuing his thoughts on the vanity of trusting 
in wealth. And so in verses 1 and 2, that's the point that he's making. Verse 1 again, there's an evil which I have seen under the sun. It's common among, among men. And then he says what this evil is. A man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor, so that he lacks nothing for himself of all he desires. Yet God does not give him power to eat of it, but a foreigner consumes it. This is vanity, and it is an evil affliction. Solomon says that there are many wealthy people who cannot enjoy their abundance. God has given them riches, wealth, honor. He says they lack nothing. So when he says God has given them these things, that would be uh, distinguishing him from the one who gained wealth through oppression. He has what is called a glorious abundance of treasures and a spotless reputation. He materially lacks absolutely nothing in any way. All of this honor, all of this wealth has come from the Lord, yet Solomon says he cannot enjoy it. He knows that God has given him all of this, and yet God restrains him from enjoying it. There are wealthy people who never enjoy the advantages of their wealth. They work hard. They save. They look forward to a comfortable retirement. But they cannot in any way make use of it. There are those who became very wealthy but become an invalid. And, and can you imagine? I mean, it, it's possible that they had put money away for some time because when I retire or when I get to this certain level of financial uh, freedom, I'm going to go to Aspen, Colorado, and I'm, I'm going to ski, and I'm going to enjoy myself. And they finally reach that point where they have that kind of financial freedom, and they have an accident, and they become crippled. And, and they had all the money, and they put everything away, but they're never able to go and do the things that they wanted to do because they didn't get a chance to use it. Um, they may have contacted a disease, and, 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 they, and they may have uh, just become bedridden. They, they, they may even die suddenly. They never get a chance to enjoy it. They may lose their family. None of their family inherit their wealth. And so he says this is something that's common. A, a man to whom God has given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he lacks nothing for himself of all he desires, Yet God does not give him power to eat of it. A foreigner consumes its vanity and evil affliction. Someone not related to him, a foreigner, gets it all and completely exhausts it. He doesn't have the ability to enjoy it. And so he leaves it for someone else to enjoy. He had said in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 21, There is a man whose labor is with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, Yet he must leave his heritage to a man who has not labored for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. And so he's saying this is common. He doesn't have the power to, to use his wealth the way that he had designed and desired. And he leaves it to somebody who didn't work for it. And that person just uses it up. And this man never has an opportunity to use it in the way that he had planned. And so what is it? He says in verse 2, it's vanity and it's an evil affliction. He goes on in verse 3 and he says, if a man begets a hundred children, he's an idiot. No, if a man, <laughs> it's hard enough to have a couple. If a man begets a hundred children and lives many years so that the days of his, of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with goodness, or indeed he has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better than he, for... It comes in vanity and departs in darkness. Its name is covered with darkness. Though it has not seen the sun or known anything, this has more rest than that man, even if he lives a thousand years twice, but has not seen goodness. Do not all go to one place. And that's another thing he's speaking about. He's speaking about long life. He's speaking about finances. He's, he's speaking about children. And uh, he speaks about living many years this long life, this finance, children, they're all regarded as blessings from God to man, all of them. Let's talk about children for a moment, shall we? 
Let's not. No, let's do so. In Scripture, children are regarded as a blessing. And they were extremely valued. Uh, I was reading concerning the Jewish perception of marriage and, and uh, having children and all. And, uh, and one rabbinic uh, teacher said that uh, in Jewish thought, the man and woman are two halves that join together to become complete. So in marriage, parents were considered partners in God's creation of a human being. So to be able to have children was therefore regarded as a tremendous blessing. In Psalm 127, verses 3 and 4, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. And blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. And so Solomon is making a simple point. A, a man can have many children, and that is a blessing from God. Because when you consider the fact that they really didn't have what is called social sec security, um, what would happen would be if I, as the husband, and my wife were able to beget several children, especially males, uh, because men are better, if we had <laughs> many males... Well, my sons had an obligation to care for me as their father. And so they would take care of me in my older age. And they would make sure I was taken care of because that was their responsibility. It was part of honoring their father and their mother. And so if I had several sons and they were all productive, the chances could be, if they were obedient to the law, that they would make sure that their mother and I lived in comfort to the end of our days. And that was a great blessing. If we had no children, that was a much more difficult situation. Because if I were to die and leave my wife alone as a widow and she had no one to support her, that would have been an extremely difficult thing for her. So in the mind of the Jewish individual during this time, and even up to this day, to some degree, to have many children was quite a blessing. Because it was going to provide for them in their old age. They would be taken care of. So they regarded it as a blessing, and that's why children are in heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward, and blessed is the one who has many children because they'll have a, a quiver full of them. And so the children are, in the hand of a, uh, are like arrows in the hand of a mighty warrior. They're, they are the protectors uh, for the old, and they're the providers, and it was an extremely important thing to have many children, and that's the point that he's making. And so children, when you have your children are intended by God to carry on godly heritage. And when you look in the book of Malachi, one of the reasons God states that he, he, he hates what's taking place, he said, I, I, I hate divorce. The reason, part of the reason that he hates divorce is because it's, it's breaking up that, that unity, that man and woman becoming one. It's breaking that unity and thus is destroying what God intended to be a source of blessing to, to the earth through the family. In the New Testament, divorce is looked at as being a terrible thing, not only because it leaves the children absent of two parents to raise them in the home, but because it also does an injustice to the image of Christ in the church, because the husband and the wife are a picture of Jesus Christ in the church, which are to be, to be together, never to be dissolved, because the church is to be in unity with its husband Christ. And so, that's one of the reasons why today there is an extreme attack on family. It is a spiritual war that is taking place that many people are not recognizing. The attack on your home is not simply a culture war. The attack on your home, if you have children, you're married with children, the attack on your home is a spiritual war where the enemy is attempting to destroy the godly heritage that is intended to be a demonstration of the unity of Christ with his bride, the church, which shows the solidity of God's work in humanity and the production of godly offspring. And so all the way in the Old Testament, there was a sense that children are a heritage of the Lord. And that's why you'll see people like Hannah, who's crying, and her husband is saying, what's wrong? 
and you have given me no children. Who am I? Who am I in the place of God to give you children? How can I do that? Because she felt that she, being barren, was not being blessed by God, because they saw children as a blessing, not an inconvenience, not something that gets in the way of you enjoying life, but actually producing the substance of your life, the joy of raising one created in the image of God into a worshiper of God. What a great challenge and what a great thing to accomplish to see your child following God because of the faith that you've exercised. And yes, there is a war on your family right now. Some of you are going through some pressures. Some of you are going to the place, have gone to the place where you're saying, I don't think I can do this any longer. What's the point? What's the use? And then you hear this, this, this story of, well, you know, God's gracious. He wants you happy. Well, the funny thing is, is that I don't know a Bible verse that says God wants me happy. He wants me blessed. But that's not the same thing as being happy because the word happy relates to the word happenings, which speaks of my circumstances, which means that I, when my circumstances are good, I can be happy. God gives you joy and God gives you blessings and he gives to you the ability to have joy in the midst of the deepest sorrow because you know that you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, but you will fear no evil for he's with you. And when you understand that as a Christian, you can go through hell and high water because you're never alone that's what christians know but the enemy wants to say you can't make it life isn't worth it let it go life is short you need to enjoy it while you got it and this person's not making you happy and after all isn't everything supposed to make you happy and if it doesn't well get rid of the person who's making you unhappy and find one who will but the problem is nobody does because nobody can make me happy. You know why? Because I'm a monster. Amen. <laughs> I'm selfish. It's got to be about me. And that's why you die to self. That's why he says, pick up your cross daily. Follow me. Why? Because the road to life is via the way of death. And when I die to my selfishness, I can live like him because he died for me. I need to learn to die to myself and to live for others. And so when Solomon is speaking here concerning a man having all of this, he has, he has wealth, he has everything, he has children. He says a hundred children, which was another way of saying he's going to be well cared for in his old age. It's another way of saying he has quite a bit of individuals who will be providing for him. He's saying if he doesn't have a relationship with the Lord, if he doesn't have satisfaction in the things that really matter, it doesn't matter at all. His soul, he says, is not satisfied with goodness. He's not content in what he has. He has no pleasure in them. He has no enjoyment of them. He has not understood that his blessings are from God. And because he hasn't understood that, he's not thankful. To know that the Lord has blessed you should motivate all of us, really, but should motivate you to thankfulness. In Hebrews 13, verse 5, the writer says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Every material thing that you've ever had <laughs> leaves you. Leaves you stranded on the side of the road when it won't start. It's stolen and forsakes you. Everything we have that is material has a shelf life. Everything. But one thing that doesn't have a shelf life because it's eternal is our relationship with God. And so when we have a, a relationship with the Lord, it's ongoing. You know, he who believes in me, Jesus said to Martha, shall never die. Do you believe this? Now, that was the big question. He who believes in me shall never die. Speaking concerning Lazarus 
and speaking concerning the hope of resurrection. She says, well, she goes, I, I, I know that when Jesus says your brother will live again, she says, well, I know he will in the resurrection of the dead. <laughs> That's when Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. You see, Martha, you've got things wrong. You, you're, you, you don't understand. You're, you're living by what you see, and, and, and you're not walking by faith. And, it, and of course, it's, it's understandable. In, in, in grief, we become blind. We only see the pain. I understand that. We all do. But you have to see beyond the pain. You have to see beyond that because uh, you have to realize that what you see right now is not forever. You need to understand that, that it goes beyond that. And, and your walk with God uh, will provide for you uh, a welcome into, into heaven itself where there are no tears, there is no sorrow, there is no pain, there is no disease, where, where there's nothing but life, and you need to understand that, you see? And that's spirituality, that's Christian spirituality. It's knowing that, that what, what gives me life is not the things that, that perish with the using. That what, what, what ultimately gives me life is my relationship with God, and, and what gives me comfort in the times that I feel alone is the remembrance of the fact that God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Yeah, my wife could someday um, leave me and forsake me. She could. She better not, but she could. <laughs> my children definitely could. One day just say, Daddy, I'm moving to North Carolina, and, and I never see him again, because that does happen. My grandchildren, they could one day just say, I got things to do, and I don't feel like hanging around with an old goat like you, and, and they could do that. And, and that's a fact. We all know that. That's nothing new to any of us. It's true. But there's one who never will leave you. And there's one who never will forsake you. And that's why you love him with all that you have. That's why you yield completely to him. He's the only faithful one that you have in your life that is 100% faithful at all times. That's Jesus Christ. That's our Christian faith, and, and it's, it's immeasurable. We need to understand that. In 1 Timothy 6, verses 7 and 8, uh, Paul said it like this. He said, we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. You've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul, in other words. And, and having food and clothing with these, we shall be content with the basic things of life. We can be content. Why? Because the secret of contentment is a relationship with God. It's trusting and knowing him. Well, instead of having the sense of joy and pleasure and blessing, he, he is miserable. And uh, as he's saying, uh, he's as miserable as a, 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 a stillborn child, if you will. And a stillborn child actually seems better off than he is. Why is that? Why could a stillborn child be better off than him? I'll read it again. If a man begets a hundred children and lives many years so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with goodness or indeed he has no burial, I say a stillborn child is better than he. How is that possible for a stillborn child to be better off than he? Well, neither one of them enjoyed life, but the baby didn't live years in misery. He says in verse 3, this man had no burial, which is another way of saying he died as one who was unloved. He died as one unloved. There have been times where we here in this fellowship have conducted funerals and are sad to see that this person who died had just maybe a handful at the most of people who showed up to grieve and to show their respects. You know, when you have, the, this room here has 760 seats here and then a number in the back. When you see three or four or five people scattered here who came to pay their respects, that's kind of what he's talking about. There was nobody there to mourn. There was nobody there to say, this is how this person affected my life. This is, there's nobody there to, sh to shed a tear. Nobody came to his funeral. He had a long life. He had many wives. He had many children. None of them showed up. None of them had anything to do with him. He died alone. He had money, children, but without love in his home, he had nothing. He had nothing. There's a song that was sung many years ago. Um, I don't remember the name of it anymore. 
but it speaks about a man who had a, a table, and he was a carpenter, and he built a table, and, and, and he had, with his own hand, etched underneath the table where nobody had known it. It was just his little secret. He had etched underneath the table uh, for my children. And this table that he had made with his own hands as a carpenter uh, was a place where in the earlier days his family would sit around and they would have meals together and they would laugh and they enjoyed one another. But in the end, his wife died and his children went other places. He didn't see them. And uh, he finally died and he, he died alone. And in the end, nobody, the song goes on and says, uh, in the end, no one would claim that table. It just was left there unclaimed because nobody cared about it. And at the very end of the song, it says, and underneath it had said, for my children. But none of his children wanted it. And that's sad because that does happen, doesn't it? It does happen. Where, where we can get caught up with so many different things that take us away from the more important things. And, and, and even though we may have, oh, a Thanksgiving dinner where we're all together, but we don't see each other again until another holiday. And then we've got our separate lives. Well, that's the picture here. He had a hundred kids. He had wives. He had money. He had it all, but he had nothing. And at the very end, when he dies, he died alone. There was nobody there to mourn him. And so we remember Proverbs 15, verses 16 and 17, where it says, Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure with trouble. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fatted calf with hatred. So as Solomon considered life under the sun, he saw the unbalanced scheme of things, and he wondered why someone would be given riches and yet not be able to enjoy them. And so the answer is the ability to enjoy life will always come from within, from within that person. Nothing that is outside can give you joy. Joy comes from the inside. And so possessions never will do that for you. In verse 7, he goes on to say, All the labor of man is for his mouth, yet the soul is not satisfied. For what more has the wise man than the fool? What does the poor man have who knows how to walk before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of desire. This also is vanity and grasping for the wind. So he, he spoke of a rich man, and now he speaks of a laborer, an average guy. And so he's saying man works long hours to satisfy his physical appetite. All the labor of man is for his mouth. So man works long hours in order to satisfy physical appetite. Yet physical appetites can never be completely satisfied as long as we are alive, which is true. I mean, you might, you might have a big meal. You might have had one tonight before you came. You had a nice big meal, and you're patting your stomach saying, oh, I ate too much. You know, honey, bring that bigger shirt out. I got to wear that tonight or whatever. You get those stretchy pants, you know. <laughs> but you'll be hungry tomorrow. You know, we had on, on one of the water fountains, I haven't even looked recently, it may not be there anymore, but we had placed above the water fountain, if you drink this water, you will thirst again. Because that's what Jesus taught us. He who drinks of this water will thirst again. If he drinks of the water that I give to him, he'll never thirst again, right? So material water quenches your thirst temporarily. That's the whole point. Physical food will quench your hunger temporarily. But you will once again be hungry. So man works long hours to satisfy physical appetites, but physical appetites are never completely satisfied as long as we're alive. So this is what he's saying when he says, yet the soul is not satisfied. Enjoying life will always be a matter of the heart and not simply the circumstances. And contentment comes from a life that is centered on eternity and not a life that is caught up with our present condition. I've said this before. I'll repeat it. Somebody asked me, when is, what, is, what would you say the, the greatest lesson you have learned in your years of walking with the Lord? What would you say is the number one lesson you've learned? And if I were to ask you that question, 
you, you might want to supply an answer for that. What is the number one thing you have learned in your time of walking with the Lord? How many years that may be. For me, it'll be 48 years uh, in December. What have I learned in 48 years? And I'll tell you, and uh, it's a very simple thing. It all works out. It all works out. What I'm so worried about right now, I don't worry about next week normally. It all works out. God is in control. He works all things together for good to those who love him, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Now, at that moment, it did not feel good, whatever it may have been. And we've all gone through terribly painful things. I'm not, I'm not minimizing pain at all. I'm not. Forgive me if it even sounds that way. I'm not. But I've discovered that even the things that broke my heart the deepest, God was able to turn around and use for a deepening in my soul. I, I have learned compassion in a ways that I never thought I would through breaking, through God breaking me, allowing things in my life to put me on my knees where I belong all the time to the point where I couldn't even hardly look up. But then I finally learned to because from whence cometh my help, my help cometh from the Lord who makes heaven and earth. He is my shield. He is my defense. He is my provider. He will never leave me. I had to learn that, not through walking in the sunshine. I learned that by walking in the shadow. I learned that, that he's an umbrella. He shades me from the heat. He's the one who provides the water when I'm thirsty, and he satisfies my hungry soul. I had to learn that, and I'm learning that now. I'm still learning that one lesson. God is good. And God loves you. And God will provide for you. And if you've ever said, God, make me like you, remember, he is the wounded healer. He was broken for us, and he will break you too. But didn't you ask him to? Oh, not really. I, I wanted him to just kind of make me. Mm. <laughs> no, you gave him permission. You said, Jesus, make me like you. And you forgot that he was hated. And you forgot that he was rejected. And you forgot that he was crucified. And here we are saying to him, make me like you, but don't give me a cross to carry. I'm sorry, but that's how you become like Christ, is by being broken and then refashioned by him. Now, I'm turning a lot of you off because you don't want that to happen. But if you want to be like him, yield to him. You had a guy come in for... Uh, meeting many years ago now, and he used to uh, work with clay. He was a potter, and uh, he wanted to talk to me about something or other. This is 30-plus years ago now, and uh, as we were talking, he said that he works with clay, and I know nothing about working with clay or anything like that, so I was interested, and he started sharing some things with me, but I'll never forget one of the things that he said, I'll always remember this. He said, you know, some of you, I wonder if there's anybody here who works with clay. If so, you'll know what he was talking about. Because he said to me, he said, there's something called willful clay. I said, and what is that? Willful clay is, we call it willful clay because it seems to have a mind of its own. He says, no matter how we try to shape it, it will go in its own pattern and, and never fully yields to our hands. And I'm thinking, oh, that can be me. I can be clay because thou, O Lord, are our, our father. We are the clay. You are the potter, Isaiah says. So I'm thinking of that. And I think, oh, I can be willful clay. And then he goes on to say, you know that the, he said, when I'm, when I'm shaping a, a pot, he goes, I, I never take my hand off the clay. My hands are on the clay. And the only time I remove my hands from the clay, this is the way he throws uh, clay, and all he says is, is I, I will remove my hands from the clay so I can moisten them with water. And then I return to my work. And I'm just listening to him, and I'm getting insights into what God does because there are times when it seems to me that he has taken his hands off of me. And then I realize that so he can pour his spirit, the water of the spirit into my life so he can finish shaping me into what he has created me to be. You're never alone. You're never without help. 
He's always working. And sometimes you may be thinking, where is the Lord? He hasn't moved. He's there. He's just getting prepared to moisten your willful little heart so that he can shape it into the image of his son. Because we are being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And that occurs through the word of God as you read it. And that occurs through the power of the Holy Spirit who works within you. And that works when the Holy Spirit convicts you and you say, God, whatever it is that you would have for me, please make me in your image. And he says, you want to be like me? And you say, yes, I do. And he says, then get ready because I will take you through things that will remove from you those things that are not necessary so that I can shape you into the one you want to be. So don't feel that God isn't working in you when some things are happening that you don't want because he's using all things to work together for good so that you ultimately will come out after you are tried, you will come out like pure gold. And all of that dross, that, that non-necessary element of the gold will have been refined. And then that craftsman, the goldsmith, will look into the gold and see his image. And that's when the goldsmith knows that the gold is pure. So when he looks into it and sees his own reflection peering back at him, that's what takes place when you go through your hard times. You're being molded into the image of Jesus Christ and your prayers are being answered, but they're not being answered like you wanted because you wanted it to come the easy way, but you said, make me like you, and that was a hard way. And so if you don't have a relationship with the Lord, you won't understand that. You're going to pursue things, but you won't pursue the creator of all things. So contentment comes from a life that's centered on eternity and not a life that is centered on the temporary. Jesus said that, Luke 12, 15, take heed, beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. One's life does not consist. The word consist, I looked that up in the original language just to see the, the meaning of it. And when he says one's life does not consist, it speaks about one's life not being held together. To consist speaks of being held together. Your life is not held together, made given substance by your material things. Your life consists in your relationship with God who keeps you together. So enjoying life is the result of a hope that's beyond your present condition. In John 10, verse 10, Jesus said, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But he went on to say, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. When Paul was speaking concerning this in Philippians 4, 11 through 13, he said, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am, California, Arizona, Nevada, whatever state, whatever state I am, to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And then he went on to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, he's not saying, and I should hasten to say this, that it's wrong to work in order to eat. Now, working to eat is something God requires of us. We're not to live off the labor of others while refusing to work ourselves. We'll be looking at that this upcoming Sunday but in Proverbs 21, verse 25, it says, The desire of the lazy man kills him, his hands refuse to labor. His point is simple. Life consists in more than simply eating and working. And if this is our whole purpose of life, then we are basically on the same level as a mere animal. In, in reality, we've been created with a higher purpose, and, and that higher purpose is what defines our lives. So our real hunger is spiritual and can only be satisfied through a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Now, in verse 8, he said, For what more has the wise man than the fool? What does the poor man have who knows how to walk before the living? Well, he says the poor man who knows how to walk. Well, that's another way of saying that this is a man who is wise. If all a person does is satisfy their natural appetites, then those professing to be wise have no advantage. 
And that's because both exist to simply satisfy their basic needs. So it's better to pursue the Lord. In verse 9, better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of desire. This also is vanity and grasping for the wind. That's an interesting, an interesting thing to say. Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of desire. It's better to have little and enjoy it than to desire much and never have it. You've got a home. I hope you do. And as you go home, <laughs> you go into your house and you have a bed. And if you're thirsty, you can turn on the faucet. You can get some water. And uh, But you see somebody in a palace, a mansion, and, and you just look at that and covet that and wish you had that. And he's simply saying, you know what? Why don't you be content with what you have? Because in looking and desiring, there's no contentment in that. I, I, I think that covetousness and envy is something that is real subtle. It's so subtle we don't even realize that we can have it. And a few years ago, uh, I went to visit somebody. They invited us over, and I went to their house, and Marie and I and uh, spent the night. They had a... Uh, what was called a mother-in-law cottage and, and uh, in this beautiful home, gated community, you know. And we went in, and, and when we went home, I turned to Maria and I said, so that's what envy is. <laughs> that's what it feels like. I said, I envy them. I want them to die. No, I, <laughs> and leave it to me. <laughs> See, because sometimes you don't even realize you can do that. I mean, yeah. Wow, that, what a, wow, you know, what a beautiful courtyard and this and that. And I th wow. So, yeah, I, I, the Lord said, see, this is what I'm talking about. You know, learn to be, con I am content, Lord. Well, you just revealed to me you're not as content as you think you are. Well, then, Lord, give it to me and make me content for you. <laughs> you are the giver of all good things. So. Be satisfied with what you have. Be thankful for it. That's the secret of contentment. Dreams and ambitions can be great motivators in your life. And chasing a dream can lead to success. And we all hear the success stories of those who pursued and accomplished their dreams. And sometimes our personal ambitions can lead us not to the accomplishments of the things we want, but to disappointment and heartache. Because we can pursue something and achieve our goal, but end up hurt and disappointed. So make sure that your ambitions are grounded in a desire to bring glory to the Lord. Like it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. In Colossians 3, 23 and 24, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not to men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. You serve the Lord Christ. In verse 10, whatever one is, he's been named already. For it is known that he is man, and he cannot contend with him who is mightier than he. Interestingly, notice how he says, whatever one is has been named already. That's another way of saying everything that a person does is previously known. God is not surprised, in other words, by anything that we can do. He's speaking of the essential nature of man. It is known that he is man, is what he's saying. So because we're human, <laughs> it's always unwise to attempt to argue with God. Notice he's, it says he has known that he's man. He cannot contend with him who's mightier than he. I, I can't win every argument that I have with a human being. Let alone God. Let alone God. And yet you see in scripture a lot of illustrations of those who contended with God. The book of Job is the greatest example of somebody who contended with God. He even went so far, when you read the book, you'll remember this, as to say, I, I wish, first he's saying, I wish I had a, um, uh, an advocate. I wish I had 
a defense attorney. And he would plead my cause before God. And he would win because he would present me as what I am. I am not guilty. And you'll see that in the opening pages of Job. And he's, he's, he's getting, he's just blown away by all the, the bad that's happened to him. This is a man who is, was, according to God, the most righteous man on the face of the earth. And, and he has these three guys who are, who are, the ones that you see the most, there are, there's one other, but there's these Job's comforters, and he calls them miserable comforters because they are, because they begin arguing with him and saying, you know, I've never seen a good man suffer like you, Job. You've been putting on for the longest time that you're good, but in fact, look at how you really are because you're, look at, you're just reaping what you've sown, and, and so Job is upset, and he's arguing through the book. He argues, and finally he says, I, I, would, I would tell God myself. I haven't done anything wrong. And then you get to God, who's been silent for all those chapters, just answering. You wanted to talk to me? Here I am. Who is this that darkens counsel? Who is this that wants to argue with their creator? And this, this man who is blustering at one point about how innocent he is, discovers that he isn't as innocent as he thinks because though he is regarded as a righteous man, he's still not a sinless man. And he's speaking to a sinless God. And when the Lord begins to ask a series of very basic questions, Job finally admits by saying, I'm wrong. I repent in sackcloth and ashes. He says, no, I, I've been wrong. And so nobody's obviously perfect. We know that. I mean, that's something everybody knows. But that doesn't stop us from arguing with God. That doesn't stop us from saying, listen, I know that you're busy in this universe running so many things, and perhaps this is something you overlooked. So if I may, I really want to let you know how you ought to do this because I'm your counselor. And can you imagine the Lord looking down at you and saying, never thought of that. You're right. I wish I'd have asked you earlier. I should have sent you a text message, man. <laughs> no, and that's the whole point here, isn't it? Uh, you can't contend with him who's mightier than you. You can't. Ultimately, God is God, and, and I'm not. So human beings do nothing that surprises God. And because we're human, it's unwise to argue with him. We, we can't argue that we're right and essentially good when God says otherwise. In Isaiah 43, 26, put me in remembrance. Let us contend together. State your case that you may be acquitted, God says. But we can't. We're lost because of our sin nature. We need help and direction from the Lord. And because that's true, it's wise for us to seek the Lord for his direction. In Jeremiah 10, 23, Jeremiah said, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. That's why I seek you to give to me direction. And then in verse 11, since there are many things that increase vanity, how is man the better? When he says there are many things, uh, the word thing speaks of speech. It speaks of words. In other words, man can argue that he's good, but his arguments are futile. Romans 9.20 asks the question. It says, indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Job again, verse 2 of chapter 40 Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? I've corrected the Lord. And God has been very kind to discipline me when I have. When I was a new Christian within the first three years of my walk with the Lord, I had a terrible habit of getting mad at God if something bad happened in my life. I can still remember, it's happened more than once, especially in my early days, but I still remember one thing in particular, I used to have a motorcycle, and, and I had gone to a 
a barber shop to get my hair trimmed because I was going to go back to school and and I had long hair and I had to get my hair cut and I, I didn't want to but I was going to Biola and Biola had a um, haircut policy and when I was in the military for two years you have to cut your hair but I had gotten out of the military and from the moment I had gotten out I hadn't cut my hair so my hair grows fast and so as my hair was growing fast and I was a long hair and the hippies were still around at that time and I was still a hippie uh, in many ways but I went to Biola and when I went they said you can come you're admitted but you have to cut your hair and I thought this is this is I was not happy about that. And so it hit me. They're not asking you to go to school there. You're asking to go to school there and seeing that they have rules. Either you abide by them or find another school to go to. That made sense to me. So I went to get my hair cut. Now, again, I've got the long hair. Prior to becoming a hippie, this is ancient history. I'm just talking. I've got a minute. You won't know this. Some of you gray hairs may remember this term. The rest of you, ancient history lesson. We had in, I grew up in Norwalk. We had a group that I was part of called the Continentals. Anybody ever hear of the Continentals? You probably, Continentals. Anybody at all? Maybe one Continentals. What are they? But anyway, <laughs> we, we, we wore hair. Have you ever seen pictures of the Righteous Brothers? Their hairstyles, where they had these old pompadours and all of that. That's how I did my hair. And I, and I would take almost a half a can of, uh, of starch, and I would starch the creases in my Levi's so they were razor sharp. And whenever I'd walk, whoosh, 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 you could hear that. I wore these sharp shoes. We, we called them co cockroach killers. Because they were pointed and you'd kill the cockroach in the corner with them. I was a continental. <laughs> that was the style. I was real skinny. When I would stand sideways and stick my tongue out, I looked like a zipper. <laughs> but anyway. And so I became a hippie. When I became a hippie, you know what hippies are. And so from continental, I went hippie. And so my head was still in the hippie thing. It still really is to this day in a lot of ways. So I'm letting my hair grow the way God intended. But I have to get my hair cut because I'm going to Biola and they're legalistic. <laughs> so I go to this barber. I didn't know barbers because hippies don't need barbers. But this guy had cut my hair once for a high school prom. That's how far back that went. And I said, you know, do this, do that, do this, do that. And he says, cool, cool. When he finished my hair and turned me around you to that moment, I had, I went back to being a continental. And I got this kind of, it looks like a 53 Chevy hood. It's kind of round. <laughs> I was really upset. And I got, that is, oh. I got on my motorcycle and I drove home. I was mad. Angry at the Lord. All I want is just an ordinary haircut. You couldn't allow an ordinary haircut. Why did... And I was yelling at the Lord all the way home. Then I washed my hair, and I tried to comb it. Mm, it's doing this thing here. I was mad. And I got on my bike, and I took off, and I hit the corner. I downshifted to power shift around and go around a corner, and the bike went out from underneath me in the intersection and spun. I was, it was a Harley. I had a Harley Sportster. And I was spinning. I hit the ground. And I didn't hear this, but I heard him. Shut up. <laughs> that was the last time I contended like that with the Lord. That's the truth. It's the last time because the Lord's, I didn't hurt myself. The bike wasn't hurt. There was no, the paint wasn't chipped. There, 
The pipes weren't bent up. I mean, I hit and spun. And it was like the Lord said, I'm not kidding. This is what I thought. I thought I, I, thought I could hear him saying, do you want to argue some more? <laughs> Who is this that contends with the Almighty? That scripture means something to me. Who are you to try and correct me? Why do you blame me for every small thing that happens in your life? Grow up, is what he was telling me. And you know what? He was right. That's a right lesson for me to learn. And I find it in Scripture. The question is asked. So, man's argument that he's basically good is futile. He doesn't become better because of his argument. You become better when you admit that you need help and agree with the Lord that you need his help. It, 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 you become better when you listen to Psalm 41, verse 4, where he said, I said, Lord, be merciful to me. Heal my soul. I have sinned against you. And so that's where it happens. You transform when God begins to work in you. And finally, verse 12, for who knows what is good for man in life? All the days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow. Who can tell a man what will happen after him under the sun? Who knows? Well, God does. And God knows what will happen next. And the fact is, we all have one appointment that we will definitely keep. And that is death. That is death. I had a friend in the military, one last story. He was very dear to me. He had like three names. I, I didn't know what his real name was for a long time. He introduced himself to me as Danny. Then he was Rocky. And then he was Roland. So I called him Roland Rocky Diaz, Danny Diaz. And he, he was from California. I was stationed with him in North Carolina. And, and so I call him Danny, but he, he liked to be called Rocky. Well, Danny was very dear to me, but was probably one of the biggest liars I'd ever met in my life. I mean, he lied, he lied, he lied so much. And I loved him terribly because he was entertaining when he lied. <laughs> we were airborne, he and I, and he didn't talk to me much about the Lord, but he would on occasion. He was also a roommate with me. And I was a, a fresh Christian wanting him to be saved, and he claimed to know the Lord. And we would have conversations, and he, again, he was a big old liar. And I got silly stories about him that I'll never forget. But one day we were in a helicopter. And when you're in a helicopter and you jump helicopters, they put a strap in front of you. They'll put what they call a stick. There's like three or four of us at the door. And, um, and then the helicopter pilot will take you up, and then he'll bank and, and so you're sitting there kind of leaning out the door and coming back. It's a blast. It's so much fun. But not Danny. Danny was not having fun. Danny had his eyes closed the whole time. And I'm just, and I still remember turning to him saying, Danny, man, isn't this? And his mouth is moving and his eyes are closed. And he was praying. He became a praying man as he was sitting there <laughs> because he was afraid he was going to die. I'll never forget that. He was given extra duty on one occasion. The only guy in the colonel's office cleaning the colonel, cleaning his office. The only guy, and he stole the colonel's jump boots. The only guy in the office, he stole his boots. And he ended up doing extra time until he, he got kicked out of the army. That was my friend, Danny. I had, I've told talk stories of him over the years, a long time ago. Marie and I, my wife, we were in Visalia years ago now. And I had said, God, I'd love to see Danny again. I wish there were a way. I don't know where he lives. And guess who was in that church service that day who came walking up to me and says, you remember me? I said, Daddy, Roland, Rocky, <laughs> the Trinity. Yeah. <laughs> How are you? It was nice to see him. And then I hadn't seen him, and he came and visited me here. 
and he told me he was moving to Las Vegas. So my, my memories of Danny are, are fond. But today I got word he died. My friend died. And, uh, and that comes to mind as I share this. That comes to mind. Who, who knows what is good for man in life all the days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? Who can tell a man what will happen after him under the sun? There's one appointment we all keep, and that's death. He got right with the Lord, by the way. And he's in glory with Jesus right now. And that gives me great joy to know that. But seeing that God knows what will happen next, he's saying, align yourself with him. In, in 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Our, our life passes like a shadow. It does pass. But when we give our heart to him, he who believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And the answer is, yes, Lord, I believe.